Welcome to the Human Origin Project, where we explore the science of you. To keep up to date, go to our iTunes channel and subscribe, and please leave a review if you enjoyed today's show. Hello and welcome to the show. Today we're going to be talking about one of the most famous archaeological sites on the planet, and that's Stonehenge. But despite millions of people visiting and countless research papers into what Stonehenge is, what it was used for, where it came from, there's still many question marks as to who really built Stonehenge and why would they go to so much trouble as to align such enormous stone pillars to astronomical features. We explore these topics amongst others in Stonehenge and really that Stonehenge was a part of a larger stone building culture that existed in the United Kingdom that we can't really explain. I hope you enjoyed today's show and if you have any questions or uh, research that you think is important to this topic, please write us in the show notes on social media and on our website and please leave a review if you enjoyed today's show. Hello, welcome to this week's show. Steph, how have you been, man? I've been good. I've been good. It's getting a bit colder over here in Australia, which is uh, it's just kind of nice. Um, it's been a very hot summer, so enjoying not feeling the heat anymore. I don't know. Today was pretty hot. It was, it was quite um, humid. I know talking about the weather is pretty, pretty <laughs> sad. <laughs> but, I, yeah, I, I have Greek heritage, so I feel the heat a lot. So days like today really, really took me down. Aren't the Greeks used to heat though? Oh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe it's the other heritage in there. <laughs> of your origin we'll find it one thing i was going to say though about the weather is that uh, i i think it's been quite warm and i think it's a little bit due to the the seasons shifting which is something that we're kind of writing about interestingly the calendar systems and a show coming up so i thought that was a nice little segue but today we're going to be talking about stonehenge and it kind of goes back to uh you know one of our first experiences in you know path to you know w- working on the human origin project and that was visiting uh, Stonehenge and for those that uh, haven't visited Stonehenge uh, Steph and I was were talking a lot of, about you know historical uh, research and uh, archaeological and anthropological um, concepts and then you know we one day we were in London together which is quite real you were living there weren't you yeah yeah it was a uh I don't know, it was a few years ago now, but yeah, I remember it, it had started off with, I think you sent me a few YouTube videos, um, you know, the kind, the ones you kind of watch really late at night and you've got nothing to do and it says, sort of pops up archaeological mystery and you click on that and you sort of, I don't know, I just remember buying a lot of books and re- getting really interested in that topic and then, yeah, when you came to London, we, we sort of decided it was, you know, just down the road really, um, we should go check it out, um, check out Stonehenge and yeah, see what all the uh, fuss was about. Hired a car, got a speeding ticket. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was a. Oh, I can't remember the type of car, but anyway, but we, we <laughs> drove to a lot of different sites. But the interesting thing about um, Stonehenge is that it. So the Salisbury Plains is a area. It's about what an hour and a half south west of London. Yeah, it depends how fast you're driving, I guess. But um, yeah, there's, it's part of like, it's, I don't know, I, I thought before we went there that Stonehenge was its own isolated um, monument. But you drive through the countryside and, and it's a whole range. There's, you know, hundreds of different sites, small and large, you know, um, different stone circles, dolmens, which are kind of like um, small versions of Stonehenge on a very simple scale. Um, you know, there's a place called Silbury Hill, which is in the same region, which is just this huge man-made mound that we um, climbed up as well. Uh, and then, you know, there's Long Barrow, which is, there's, there's just all these sorts of, uh, it's like a whole landscape of these ancient sites that all seem to be interconnected in some way. Yeah, and um, Avery is nearby, which is a very famous stone circle yeah the largest largest stone circle anywhere in the world it's got a uh i think there's a village built inside it now there's a bar and a post office and some houses and there's only a few stones left standing but um yeah we're gonna we're gonna cover this in a future article that the what it once looked like is in breathtaking it's you know it covers kilometers of space and it's just enormous and could have been part of a bigger complex 
that was big in itself. Avery's enormous when you think of the size. The stones are kind of massive, they're unshaped. They're different styles of stone hinge, aren't they? But they're very kind of big clump stones set up in a line. And what was that? There was like that longer one we went to just before Avery. What was that Yeah, uh, I think it was High Bennett Long Barrow or High Kennett Long Barrow. Um, sorry to all the English listeners out there if I've just murdered the pronunciation. But yeah, that, that it sits right next to Silbury Hill and it's another kind of anomalous site that seems to be um, uh, dated to the same period or built by the same um, ancient inhabitants um, who no one really knows much about. You know, there's there's folklore regarding these sites. I think Stonehenge, there's myths about it being built by giants. I think one of the old um, names for it was the Giant's Dance. Um, and the, for those of you who know about uh, King Arthur and the stories of Merlin um, there's an old myth where Merlin was involved in, in building Stonehenge you know using his magic to um, lift the stones into place so there's all these fragmentary sort of stories um, and no one has really no one really knows you know who built it or why or I think we're only people are only just starting to scratch the surface now yeah that was really when you know we were first discussing Stonehenge you know looking into the history I'm my mother was is Welsh, so um, I, I have Welsh heritage, and it just baffled me that you know in the United Kingdom, where you know it's one of our you know founding kind of um, you know, ancestry lines, you know that we don't know where they came from or who the, were the people that you know were were based in this land before. It's it's very strange, isn't it? And you know that kind of talks of druids, and um, we're, we're going to be covering this a lot more later and you know there's a lot of people that research in this area but you know today we're going to mainly go into the site of Stonehenge but that's just a little bit of a primer for, for those that haven't been to Stonehenge and the Salisbury Plain a perspective is you drive along these kind of long grass you know grassy fields I mean, yeah it's a very view in the field it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's very uh it's very quintessential uh English English uh landscape you know there's rolling hills there's golden sun lots of sheep uh, lots of little little villages with thatched roofs and smoke coming out of the chimneys, which is very different scenery to what we're used to over here in um, Australia. But yeah, you're just driving along. The highway is literally, you know, 50 metres from the stones and you're driving along and all of a sudden you come to a traffic jam um, and 20 minutes later you're rolling, rolling, rolling and all of a sudden these stones just appear out of nowhere and they're huge. And, you know, the people that are walking around them that you can see from the car are just these tiny little dots and it's just it just it yeah it blows blows your mind seeing them it really does and the size of the stones really blew my mind you know um you know, they're kind of that very rough kind of um shaped stones they're, they're a little bit they're not so fine like you you know what you see in egypt which is very very precision cut it's it's not like that it's more of a rough um you know rounded shapes but they're, they're just enormous and, you know, when, and then you think of, you know, some of the size and they're lifted up and sitting. It, they're also unique in the style of the sites on the Salisbury Plain, aren't they? Because you have the Salisbury Hill, which is what's said it used to be like a white brick pyramid-like building, which is re really unexplained, isn't it? Yeah, I think it, it's because it, it's made of, it, I think it's chalk. There's a lot of chalk in that part of England. Um, yeah, so there's something to do with the, the chalk and the colour white and there's these tales of it, you know, glowing and this sort of thing. But, um, yeah, the Stonehenge is, is really unique in the area because, I mean, there's there's lots of stone circles in that area but also all across the UK and, and across the world there's thousands and thousands of stone circles. I mean, we think of Stonehenge as the stone circle, um, the only stone circle, but, yeah, the more that, that we've been learning, we kind of realise that they're everywhere almost on every continent um but stonehenge is different in that it's got these huge stones that make up a, the circle but it's a bit more sophisticated than that there's um these lintel they're, they're known as lintel stones that um sit at the top they sort of cap the standing stones on the outside and they um there's only a few left today but um if you if you look at old recreate like uh, old images of what it would have looked like it um it was this perfect kind of Cir uh, enclosed circle with these three huge standing trilithon type structures in the middle of it. It would have been, um, yeah. It would How have been were they amazing. shaped in the middle? What was the 
Uh, there's like three, um, I think they're trilithons. They're just three freestanding kind of stone um, blocks. Uh, and then there are a few other stones sort of dotted around. Um, but they call it, a, it's like a horseshoe sort of shape um, of these three um, three large large internal stones that um, that line up to certain um, astronomical um, bodies um, on the solstices. And um, yeah, they would have been used in ancient times as sort of observational points or marking points for, of some sort, I guess. Yeah, and so there, there's lintels, isn't there, which are the ones that sit on top? Yeah. And, and what are the stones supporting the horizontal stones called? Is there a name for them or not really? So there's this the frick the the standing the vertically standing stones and then the horizontal ones that are laid on top. And yeah. so it was originally a circle of these made yeah. up. Yeah, and they're not the they're not just placed on top of these standing stones. These these lintel stones were carved out in mortar and tessel joints, which are which are used in woodworking to to create sort of complex joints where you don't need screws or nails. You can just sort of put put the pieces of timber together like a jigsaw puzzle and that's what they were doing um you know 3000 plus bc with stone it's a, uh, it's remark like it, even lifting those stones up to that point would have been remarkable enough but the fact that they could join them with pretty advanced joinery especially with stone um yeah it would have been a it would have been pretty tough to uh to put that together incomprehensible really um I think they've tried to recreate, you know, and, and they've they've used, you know, lots of groups of men and, and broken pulley systems to to recreate that. But it, to me, it doesn't really explain, you know, how you go and design a huge, you know, that that um, lever system. What, what do you call it? The to to lift the stones. The test. No, the, 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 oh, the mortar and tessel. Yes. Yeah. So stones of that magnitude in mortar and tessel at, with the plan to it's 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 a huge design I, I i don't know i just don't see anyway they, they've recreated to some point but they also had issues yeah i remember watching that documentary uh and i think the boat that eventually arrived with the stone ended up sinking because it was too heavy and that was they were trying to recreate it to only use you know equipment and tools that were available back um 3000 BC um, and they couldn't do it so it sort of throws up into the air how they how they managed to do it because these stones weren't just around the corner or you know they didn't just pick them up from around the local landscape so they were kind of all taken from very far away um, places. There were two types of stones when there were the sarsen stones which are the bigger ones which you probably recognize from Stonehenge and then they were quarry reasonably close yeah, I think they were. It's thought that they were only, oh, I say only twenty twenty to thirty miles away um, to the north of England. Um, but some of these stones, I think, weighed up to five or ten tons, which is, you know, moving that today. I like people say that it was ropes and lift and huge amounts of people, but trying to move a twenty-five ton block, um, yeah, it seems very. Yes, yeah, twenty-five tons. That's enormous. And not just not just that heavy, but huge. Um, I thirty think the, feet tall. Yeah, I think the tallest thirty feet, which is, um, yeah, trying to imagine a stone that big being moved and and placed and dragged, you know, dragged along the ground for thirty miles. You would have had to be really sure of what you were building and the and reason shaping why. shaping it in a mortar and tessel, it's unbelievable. Yeah, and the scale. And then to make it more complicated, there are different types of stones called blue stones, which were the, the ones placed in the middle. And they went to the trouble of, of quarrying them from a mine in Wales, which is 160 miles or kilometers. Yeah, 160 miles. Miles. <laughs> yeah. Which, yeah, it, it don't even know where to start with that one. Um, and know. in a landscape that was quite different back then too, there would have been more forest. Yeah. So, uh, like driving through England today, there's lots of farm and lots of um, hills, and um, there's there's small amounts of woodland and that sort of thing. But back before civilization um, in the UK, it would have been, yeah, dense forest land and lots of streams and really that area is quite swampy and marshy and it would have been, yeah, it would have been really difficult to manoeuvre the landscape and also carry these stones and put them in place and even, I, I don't even know how they would have carved them. Like, 
a huge project, yeah, that, of people we don't know. And, you know, obviously for a purpose you know, that we still don't know. So it's just it just builds to the mystery of Stonehenge, doesn't it? And there's something around the landscape and the relationship to water as well, isn't there? Or the water surrounding? Yeah, there's... um. There's a moat next door. Uh, one, there, there's like a there's a, a ditch dug around the outside of of the um, of the complex, and I think uh, I I read something on that the it's, it lies on the highest point, so it would have potentially been like an island at some point, maybe. Yeah, there are some. Uh, yeah, I think there are some people that have talked about the potential. Um, yeah, the potential waterways that were nearby and that Stonehenge sits on the highest point of the surrounding area. So it could have potentially been a place where people would have had to, um, you know, get to by water, whether that's by boat or by, you know, wading or swimming through the water. Um, but it was kind of this like high place with with these, with this megalithic site just um, placed on top. Um, but yeah, there's this strange connection with water as well. I think Stonehenge if you drew a line of latitude from Stonehenge across around the earth, it, it covers the least amount of land of any other latitude. So it, you would hit more water than land in that specific latitude than you would in any, any other one. It's always strange, those Mitch. I never know how that anyone comes up with that. Yeah. Is it just is it just someone looking for coincidences? Or, but yeah, there, there seems to be some sort of connection to water and, um, and that similar to a lot of other sites, especially in the UK, but also around the world, it seems like they were very specific about where they um, where they decided to build. They didn't come across a spot and build there and then drag the stones. They waited until they found the perfect place where, you know, they, there was a lot of old practices of what we have called magic or witchcraft or divination or things in, talked about in ancient times. And this was, this was really um, revered. By the ancients so whether that the builders of Stonehenge did, did that or not um, we're still not sure but there is a uh, a really interesting because Stonehenge wasn't built the the structure you see now of Stonehenge wasn't built originally that way it was um it was built in stages um, over I think a few thousand years yeah um, well, up to ten thousand years which is interesting for the water because these are clearly there's potentially times when water levels may have been higher, uh, maybe not 10, well, depending on, there was obviously fluctuations, but the there's timber poles, uh, pine poles in the, the in the car park that date to, they can carbon date them to 10,000 years old. Yeah, which is, you, you would barely notice they were there when you go to Stonehenge. You sort of enter the site and you walk uh, across the country and you get to the site and then sort of hidden away in the corner of these old just in the car park i think next to the car park there's these three um sort of flat monuments just circles on the ground that are representing the um the stone poles that were once there when they first found the site and these date back to 10,000 uh, these back date back 10,000 years which is um you know the the first um the first stages of stonehenge didn't begin till about um 3100 bc um yeah, the outer rim. Yeah, right? the outer, so, like the. Yeah. Um, so there was there's this huge span of time where, you know, these poles were almost, were either acting as a, some sort of um, guide for people to realise that this this space was sacred or this space was important. Um, it's almost like they were marking out the landscape for some future, some future traveller, some future culture who understood the importance of that area would realise that it was it was a good place to build this. Um, this site it's a huge span of time too i mean you were talking you know 10,000 to um to 3150 bc um you know it's 7,000 years so it's it's quite a a huge something's going on here for a long time and the, the other thing too that i don't really see much on is that there's really no discussion because 10,000 years ago is a long time right and there's that's long before many of the um you know known you know um, settlings in the UK and so why you know what could have been, possibly been the explanation for that yeah who did and, and it's not just leaving you know leaving a stone a small stone as a marking these were huge huge tree trunks that were either buried I think they were buried a few metres down into the earth and they were poking out um, 
Is there any talk of them being like totem poles or anything like that? Or I don't, I don't, I don't know. The, all I've heard is that they were marking. They they seem to be marking the site. Um, but yeah, it's strange because as we were saying before, the the first stages of what is now Stonehenge began construction at around 3150 BC. Dating for it has been really hard because they're you obviously can't date stone, um, so it's sort of left to evidence, you know, of bones or of tools or materials that were left behind. Um, but yeah, around that time was when the first uh, there was a, there was the the ditch that now surrounds Stonehenge was thought to have been dug, and um, the first of the timber they, they were originally timber. Well, they, they thought that they were originally timber poles that just circled the site so it was just like a very primitive stone circle made of timber posts um surrounded by this ditch um and then i'm not sure exactly the the next steps that got to where stonehenge is now it's all i remember seeing it all in the um stonehenge museum that we passed by um a few years ago but there's yeah there there was about two thousand years of transition to the site that is today so there was obviously a big project that had been designed and there was like a blueprint that was being followed it wasn't just built and left it was you know the site was marked the people returned or the people had knowledge of what why why this site was important and then you know the building started beginning and it's you know if you were part of building this site back in you know neolithic times it would have been so i mean for us anyway it's strange to think of starting a project that you're not going to finish in your lifetime and knowing that it's for a purpose for everyone to enjoy it you know even if it's 2000 years in advance that's that seems ridiculous to us now i can't imagine starting to build my house and saying it's not going to be done for 2000 years but someone will enjoy it one day yeah completely incomprehensible but also um these kind of trends really do um they echo around the world too you know in egyptian and mayan and other cultures there's evidence that sites were built in stages and you know on on top of each other you know pyramids you know the mayan many of the pyramids you know had the bases that were seen to be this marking point of this sacred point where there would be these huge structures and then similar to stonehenge and so you start at ten thousand years in the car park then you go in this outer ridge that is dated to roughly 3200 bc and then 1500 bc is the final inner so it was this 7000 year span which you don't really hear much about do you that there was so much going on and there's also even um other sites around so they said there's a super hinge that's been found that which we'll cover but that has huge huge a much much larger ring the remnants of that was older and larger and it's and when you connect this all to the all the other sites around the Salisbury Plain, it, it's bizarre to think what was going on and to think we don't know who these people were. Yeah, and and there's um there's a researcher named Alexander Tom who is probably the forefather of you know the obsession of stone circles and understanding Stonehenge and other sites around England. He he spent a lot of his life going to these sites, going to, and and measuring every last stone and measuring the circles and measuring. Um, the distances between stones and the alignments that they faced and collating all of this data to try and get a picture of why. Because these sites, it wasn't that there were just stone circles all across the UK. Um, Alexander Tom found that all these sites followed the same blueprint in terms of measurement, that, that, that you could um, to deduce down find this common um, unit of measure that he, he called the megalithic yard which I think it's 2.72 feet. Um, and that this measurement is found, you know, all through Avebury, which is that large stone circle we we're talking about, all through the stone circles that he found in Scotland and Ireland. Stonehenge um, has the same measurements. Um, so it seems like while Stonehenge was being built and, um, you know, as part of this design that spanned thousands of years, these other sites could have potentially been built by the same plan or by the same people or at least by people who understood um, the same unit of measure and, and sort of incorporated that into their um, into their culture. It's a really strange thought trying to imagine these people who we still don't really understand, but we see these remnants of them literally left to us in stone. And, and what was his 
But so what's the measurement of it's 2.72 that they use as a unit of measurement? Do, do you know how you base to find that? It, I think it was just to start. It was just a bit of trial and error, and um, he uh, he's sort of been discredited because he he was working back uh, in the days before radiocarbon dating, and um, so he was trying to date these sites by their astronomical alignments. Um, so if he found measurements and found alignments through those measurements, um, he would try and you know determine when they were built. And, and so that's how he came up with his you know measurement too by astronomical because, yeah 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 I mean, because i mean everyone knows that stonehenge um i mean it's one of the biggest parties in the uk on on the summer solstice there's 40 plus thousand people that that go there and um you know there's from from early afternoon until well into the night until the next morning there's you know there's drumming circles and fireworks and people chanting and there's pagans and druids and um you know people people from all walks of life that go and celebrate and and wait for the sunrise sun to rise on the winter on the summer solstice sorry um and it's i've I've never seen in my life i've seen videos and and pictures of it but it the sun rises perfectly over um these this uh central stone and um it's yeah it's a it's still so thought-provoking to people today that there you know thousands and thousands of people go and it's it's still so celebrated because it's such a phenomenal thing to see. And it's growing too, which is quite remarkable that, you know, something so old, you know, it's not dying out. This is getting more and more and more popular. You know, they've put a visitor centre in Stonehenge because of the traffic of people that go there. And then, as you say, the, the celebrations on this, you know, which is may have been similar to what was happening actually when it was being used. But um, the interest in these sites are growing, which is, you know, Stonehenge is the most popular or most well-known megalithic site in the world and um well actually the, the egyptian pyramids might actually be the most well known but anyway it's one of the most yeah it's one it's one of when you talk about ancient sites you, you say the pyramids and stonehenge they're they're the they're definitely the starting point i'd say yeah, and yeah. it it you know we we're not kind of you know having these things in history and then kind of leaving they, they're becoming more and more um you know the interest is growing in them, which is really, you know, and, and we're going to be covering this a lot because, as you said, there's a lot to this history that we don't know. And so, you know, it's it's really, I think, within our interest to understand this more. And, you know, it's interesting that the idea of archaeoastronomy and a lot and understanding what the people knew that built these monuments, what they were um, directing to in terms of the astronomical lines is now much better known. This has been one of the biggest advancements in understanding these megalithic sites is that they were built with the knowledge that, uh, and alignment to astronomical bodies. And so the, the, the winter solstice, which, sorry, the summer solstice, which marks the longest day of the year in the United Kingdom is aligned to with these stone sets. And there are sites all over the planet that do this, and particularly in Ireland, there's some um, sites that do many of and there's lots of different things they measure, but there's no argument now that megalithic and ancient sites were built with the idea of these astronomical um, bodies. And so, and there's more, there's, there are more um, alignments too, aren't there? Yeah, there's, there's some there's some really interesting um, alignments with, uh, with as we've talked about, you know, the, the summer solstice sunrise. Uh, the winter solstice sunset is also very popular among the diehard fans of Stonehenge. You know, they go out there in the freezing cold snow and, um, you know, brave the winds and the English countryside to um, to witness the sun setting um, on the winter solstice. But also, the number the, the, there are these numbers that keep popping up within Stonehenge, which point to astronomical alignments. Um, there are uh, the the outer stone circle is made up of. 29.5 stones not 30 or, or 29 but 29.5 which is the, the number of the lunar month which which seems to relate to you know the astronomy of the site and how the ancients were you know following the moon and tracking it in stone and understanding that uh, this was an important figure to to keep note of um, that, that's remarkable isn't it that there are multiple astronomical measurements written into this site in that it's 29.5 year being the lunar cycle which isn't a particularly hard astronomical it's one of the easiest astronomical 
uh, yeah, but just to... just the fact that that um, you would include that in your like it it I mean we we I mean you see the moon um, fill and then become new and start again, but the the fact that they went to so much trouble to encode that into the structure it's really fascinating to me. And these are this is something that we look at with the calendars a lot, but the the lunar cycle was far more integrated into people's lives than what they are today. You know, we have a pseudo lunar solar calendar today um, where our month is, you know, not based on, you know, we have days of the month which aren't based on any cycle. And so the fact that these people kept more accurate track of the moon than we do is quite interesting because you don't in your everyday life really think of um, you know, the lunar cycle. And there, there are, and we're going to cover this, but there are, um, you know, biological and you know geological you know it affects the tides of the earth the, the lunar um the moon itself is a sixth of the has gravity um influence as to the earth so it, it influences all of the bodies of water on earth in tides and so does this speak of ancient people having you know a, a tighter knowledge of these influences I, I, I to me it feels like they do yeah, and that there are all these old um, examples in ancient cultures of these numbers popping up again and again. Obviously, the lunar cycle is a big one. Um, as you said, we'll talk about it um, in a future podcast, but a lot of the earliest calendars are lunar calendars or lunar solar, lunar solar calendars. And some existing today as well, the Jewish calendars. Yeah, yeah. And so there are, you know, very, there is a lot of dependence on the cycle of the moon and how that syncs up to your culture and how that syncs up, you know, you basically hold everything's based on time for us today and if that's if you've got that perfectly aligned in the structure um you know that that really shows how important it is to to you know keep track of and to make sure it doesn't drift and doesn't change um another interesting number is the number 19 which pops up a lot in um you know in old cult like the mayan i think have number 19 quite a lot and in in the the chinese calendar have the number 19 as um and the 19, in regards to Stonehenge, there are 19 blue stones um, that make up the horseshoe shape. Um, and 19 is is the number of years in the metonic cycle, um, which pretty much means that if there's a full moon on your birthday, say today's your birthday and there's a full moon in the sky, on that very same day in 19 years, there will be another full moon. Um, so it's just another way to keep things in sync. and. Um, you know, to understand, to uh, yeah, a, a way to cast in stone that that sort of knowledge, to um, to keep track of the um, very yeah, very important to the culture that you know was were responsible for um for building it. And we, of the lunar cycle, we definitely don't consider the metonic cycle in that you know the, there is this nineteen year exact lining up of the lunar calendar, which is you know we'll, we'll cover that in detail, but. So there were 19 stones were there that represented this year. Is, is that what it was? Yeah, yeah, the so blue each, stones. yeah. So each year you tick tick over to the next one. And that's kind of like if you imagine looking at Stonehenge from the top and picture it as a sort of clock with these different spinning axes of of information. But there's another interesting number that pops up um, in the Aubrey Circle, which is the uh, in the first the first instalment of Stonehenge where there were these ancient um, oh, circle, circular holes dug. Um, there are 56 of them, which um, which were heavily influenced in the um, use of eclipses and predicting eclipses, especially. Um, that's something that is quite complex to describe without images. So I think we'll talk about that. We'll probably have an article about that in the near future. But if you if you track like a, like a clock hand does, if you track the sun and the moon around these 56 stones. I think the degree of accu- accuracy for re- predicting the eclipses is something like 99.4% accuracy, which is, I mean, I don't know when the next lunar eclipse is. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think many people you talk to would know, but the, but the inhabitants or the builders of Stonehenge definitely knew and definitely wanted everyone to know or wanted to encode it for... There's quite a complex mathematic um, process to understand yeah, yeah. Lunar, I was I was trying to wrap yeah. my head around it today, but it's yeah, it's it's pretty in depth. I think. So it's all written into the stones, which is you know that that's remarkable that it's this huge calendar system that 
marks time and astronomical bodies and you know this idea of you know our connection to um you know our solar system and beyond it's it's very very interesting and um you know even like i I haven't been there either but just seeing that sun rise on that summer solstice day and then hitting exactly on that heel stone it must be a remarkable feeling and then you know these kind of uh, observations to be made all around the world. They were they were marking this point, you know, for um, I think it's beyond time too. There must be something significant about that for them to go this much. Because imagine how hard it is all of those construction um, metrics that we talk about, the size of the stones, the, the distance of the stones, the the quarrying and carving of the stones, and then to put them into exact alignment in a spot that was marked ten thousand years before. That just goes it blows my mind as to you know what they were thinking of and um you know i want to know what they're thinking of for one but you know it two i think we really need to you know really appreciate the complexity of of these people yeah and i think that's one of the most important things just just realizing that there is you know it's not just some stone standing in in on the hillside now it's it's this this ancient mystery that people are still fly, flocking to there's millions of moons of people that go to stonehenge and something when you go there and see it, and I'm sure people listening will have the same experience. When you when you physically are there, you can't actually walk inside the stones, but you get close enough to to really feel the the lands feel the power of the landscape and the power of, of you know imagining what it would would have once looked like. Um, yeah, it's it's breathtaking. There are many mounds around, and we mentioned it's the part of a bigger complex, but there are many mounds around um, Stonehenge too, and there's also like a a large runway kind of that was the i mean that was the first thing you met with when you go start to walk over to the site from the visitors and there's this huge runway kind of yeah it's outside. very it's very bizarre there's like a a long flat runway and there's all these you know conspiracy theories of people saying it's a ufo landing site or people saying that it was just a carved it was just for the water to flow down or whatever but they're surrounding this are all these strange little knolls and mounds of, and earthworks of kind of it looks like um braille writing like you you just they just little clusters here and there dotted around the landscape some say they represent stars too or yeah i i mean i i don't know much about them i just know that they are everywhere around stonehenge and also around the surrounding areas like avebury and um silbury hill and um it's very yeah it's 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 it doesn't no no one really knows yeah i mean there's people talking about that they could have been astronomical they could represent stars yeah who knows? Who knows indeed. And, you know, there's a lot to cover on this topic. Um, you know, I think we'll, in future we'll, we'll cover the the other sites like Avebury. And um, also, too, there's there's an interesting line on who built these sites and going back to these older sites. So we'll be covering that as well. Um, but overall, you know, a lot of years of research has gone to this. You know, many scientists, many, many um, independent researchers and all these, you know, people just visiting the site and we're still a long way from the answer aren't we yeah and I, I think the uh just the fact that there are so many people that have been really looking into this for so long there is so much out there to go through so i mean yeah there, there's just there's almost too much it's it's really it's really hard knowing where to turn to and who to talk to about it because there's just such a wealth of information but no one is really pulling it all together which is something that's been really exciting and um you know, talking. I mean, I remember when I've, I've actually been to Stonehenge three times now, I think. And the second time, I, I went with an, another friend who knew a lot about the site, and you know, talked me through a lot of things that he'd come across through just talking to friends and through reading old, strange books he found in libraries, and you know, talking to the locals. And there's so much information out there, but it's really, it's really hard to dig through unless you've got, you know, a basis for it. And that's really what we're trying to trying to get down here and it's it's really opening up yeah a lot of a lot of new a lot of new questions but also a lot of a lot of new information which is really um exciting definitely all right so i think um that pretty much covers it doesn't it uh, you know there's going to be a lot more on this topic um so anyone that has anyone that anything they want they'd like covered on stonehenge or anything they uh, they, they're particularly read or researched or um, would like research, please leave it in the comment section on the social media and um, and, and the website as well. Uh, there's an article and on the website with an infographic on the details that we talk about in this 
um, in the show and also in the show notes as well we'll link to uh, the, the different references all right I think that pretty much covers it doesn't it? so what are we going to talk about next week um, maybe we should talk about the calendar systems we gave everyone a bit of a teaser maybe that was a bit should... of a teaser wasn't it yeah okay there's a lot of stuff to cover that's yeah, yeah. we could start with our calendar maybe yeah the Gregorian calendar all right I'm looking forward to it I'll see you guys then all right Steph see you man see ya Thank you for listening to today's show. For more information, you can read the full transcript, articles, and discussion on our website, humanoriginproject.com. You can visit us on social media at Human Origin Project on Facebook and The Human Origin Project on Instagram. Follow us on Twitter or join the forum boards and email list to keep up to date with all the new information. And if you enjoyed today's show, please subscribe on iTunes and leave a review because it helps others to find this information and helps us to bring you the topics you want to discuss and hear about. Until next week, I hope your life is filled with happiness, healthiness, and harmony.